Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to BC 212, our class on Christian apologetics. Let's um, take a moment to pray and then we will start. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get together like this and take time to study and learn and be equipped. We ask for the ministry and the work of your Holy Spirit to impart wisdom, understanding, clarity to us in the things we learn, things we study, so that, God, we could serve you well, we could serve people well. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Last week, we were looking at um, sharing Christ with a Hindu, lesson number 13. And then we are going to start today, lesson number 14, sharing Christ with a Muslim. Any, Chris, any questions on sharing Christ with a Hindu? Any thoughts? Any questions? Okay. So we started talking about sharing Christ with a Muslim. And uh, just some basic, we went through some basic differences between the Christian faith and Islam. We did that already, right? Half, till the table. Uh, oh. Yeah, we covered, okay, till the table. Okay, till that. Right. So, you know, it's good for us to know the differences. And I think... Um, uh, a very important point is um, that the, the, the Bible talks about one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But in Islam, there's one God, but it is very they cannot understand the concept of God in three persons. So it is like a stumbling block. So when we start, uh, when we are having conversation with a Muslim, uh, don't bring up the Trinity beginning. They will, <laughs> what is this man talking? It's very confusing. Right? So uh, just refer to God as God. Thank you. I'm sorry if I gave you trouble. I asked. For tea and okay, good. thank you, thank you so much. Sorry, sorry for the trouble. Or tea or coffee, I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, so don't. So we won't get. Just refer to God as God. Later on, they will understand about Trinity. So, but in the beginning, don't start. Huh? But that will become a hindrance. It become like argument. All those things. God is God. Okay, let's start from there. Some other things to understand a little bit about Islam. Uh, the meaning of Islam simply means submission. Submission. Uh, so it's like, a, uh, so you can think about the idea in their minds. So just don't ask any questions. Submit. So Islam itself means submission. So that is why um, they have this idea of uh, just do. Don't ask questions. Don't, you know, because asking questions may be considered a rebellion, challenging. So Islam means submission. Just listen, just do. So Muslim is one who submits. You now founded by Muhammad around 600 AD, about 600 years after the Christian faith. And uh, he's believed to have received uh, messages from God through Angel Gabriel. Um, the two main confessions or affirmations uh, is, I bear witness that there is no God but God. I bear witness that Muhammad is the apostle or prophet of God. So these are two statements you will make over and over again. There's only one God uh, and uh, Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet. So it's like those two sentences are in them, ingrained in them. Only Allah is God, Muhammad is his prophet. 
then there are five pillars or um, things that they practice, which is the confession of faith, which we just read. Five times a day you pray, give to the poor, you fast in the month of Ramadan, you go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, and the sixth one is optional, which is engage in jihad. And if you give your life in defense to your faith, uh, they believe you'll go straight to heaven. What they believe. So, okay. so within Islam, there are at least three different sects, Shiites, Sunnis, and Sufis. And uh, uh, again, I, I don't necessarily know everything about the de details of this. You can read it up if you wish. But you understand that the Shiites and Sunnis, uh, I think the Shiites and Sunnis are the two major groups. Sufis, uh, I'm not sure how uh, prominent they are these days. But that's the difference between you know the Iranians and Iraq. They are both Arab nations, but uh, some of them are Shiites, some of them are Sunnis, and so there's some difference within them. Um, a Muslim, uh, Islam is the way of life. Mufti is their leader. When he issues a fatwa or a decision, uh, it's almost like you have to follow it. That's the law. Right. It's a decision that's made, and uh, the Mufti gives this uh, fatwa, and you have to follow it. And they can issue all kinds of things, uh, fatwas. And sometimes they even issue, okay, your, this person has to be killed. Uh, they go and kill him. One Mufti issued a fatwa, go do it. You know, so. And uh, the unforgivable sin in Islam is uh, ascribing equals to God. And uh, so that is where, you know, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity that, you know, God in three persons, how can there be somebody else who is co-equal with God, uh, is, is very difficult. All right, so some basic understanding of Islam. I mean, it's not like a detailed study. There are, like I've met, uh, and maybe you've also met, uh, uh, people who have become believers from Islam, who have studied the law and all. I remember meeting this one person. Um, I think he's based in Delhi. He's a, he's a pastor now. I met him in in a conference, and he was sharing his testimony. So he was actually studying to be an imam. So. Uh, he was studying in, uh, first he was studying in Kerala somewhere, at, uh, the training where they're going. So he was studying, a young man, very in, smart young man. Uh, he was studying to be imam. And uh, at that time, he he was just asking questions, you know, like reading the, he went through the Quran, all those things, studying. And it seemed like, and I forget all the details, but Reading the Quran, his interest about Jesus was, you know, sparked. So he started exploring the Christian faith, you know, quietly, secretly. He's studying in the training center to become an imam. But now his interest in knowing Jesus has been thing. And he started reading the, secretly, you know, reading the New Testament. Then he said, this New Testament is making more sense than the Quran. He didn't know what to do. And uh, I think he was, uh, after he graduated everything, he was sent to Hyderabad to be in a imam in a mosque there. But inside him, there is a struggle. You know, okay, he's qualified, he's trained, he's studied, but uh, his interest now is in the Bible, in Jesus, it's reading. It's very difficult that time. And then he started talk, asking some questions, you know, from the uh, the people inside, you know, the clerics. Uh, the they were also very upset with him. What are you asking? You know? And then finally, he through his own study. 
he came to faith in Jesus. Then he came out. And uh, now he's preaching the gospel. Uh, he's serving as a pastor. I, I can look up his name. I have it on his. Huh? Abdullah. Okay. But uh, he was such a brilliant scholar. Hmm? Anyway, I, I had to look, look up his name. But I was so, I think, and he is so, for he has studied both sides. And he is, because he was trained as a imam, he has studied everything about Islam and all of that. And now, of course, he has studied the Bible. And so he knows both sides. So it's very, so somebody like that can talk to, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the Muslims and, you know, explain to them. So it's quite uh, fascinating. And then, of course, there is this other lady from Hyderabad who came and she did one seminar for us also. Uh, I think she even came to Bible. I'm not sure if she came to Bible but we took all our Bible college students to. She came to Bangshi uh, workshop. I'm forgetting her name. Huh? And, uh, is that, what's the name? I think that's. Dr. Mario Sozef is name. Mario uh, Sozef. Okay, okay. I'm not. Can't, I'm sorry. I can't uh, check He's his. From name. Kerala, right? He's become a uh, Christian. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Could be. Could be same. Okay. Yeah, but I was just mentioning that these are people you know, like these people who have come from the Muslim faith, who have become believers, who understand both sides, you know, and they can really explain uh, to the Muslim about the Christian faith, right? But for us, okay, let us understand some basic things. If we enter into a conversation, what can we do? What are the points of emphasis? Okay. Um, so the, the first thing is also is to be to be conscious that just because you meet a Muslim doesn't mean uh, they're all the same. Okay. Some Muslims are fundamental, that means they're very strong in their faith. Some are contemporary. That means they are very open-minded. Sometimes they are disillusioned by what they have seen in Islam. Uh, and so you, you'll find different kinds of people. So I'm try to understand them uh, so that then you can present the gospel in a proper way. Right? Uh, not all Muslims believe the same way. They're not at the same, you know, they're not all fundamentalists. Now, uh, so we said traditional Muslims, they're not sure of their salvation. Modern Muslims have a lot of new thought. They're very open, uh, things like that. So you, you establish friendship, uh, very important to get to know the person. Now, three things. You know, they would normally have question, which is about the deity of Christ, about his death, and about his resurrection. They would generally have, if they have been in the mosque, listening to the teaching these three things they have been made to challenge question don't believe in the deity don't believe in the death don't believe in the resurrection so that is in the back of the minds for a traditional muslim a contemporary muslim may not have been practicing so different so how do we engage with these people we start by emphasizing god as a loving creator because in their minds Allah, Islam, the idea is you submit to this very powerful, almighty, distant God. He's God, He's powerful, but He's distant. You just submit to Him. The idea of God being a loving Father is not there. It's not there. So that is our starting point. God, who is a creator. Yeah, we believe in God, who is creator, who is powerful. But the Bible also is presenting him as a loving father. So that is a new idea, new concept for them. Yeah. Second, the idea of sin. They also believe in sin. Yeah, don't do wrong. But... Sin, we need to help them understand sin affects the relationship with God and sin has its consequences. 
and also you can know uh, that forgiveness is the next point. But so to have them understand that sin affects your relationship with God, and God has to judge sin. So if you ask a Muslim about forgiveness, he will say, if God wants to forgive me, he will forgive me. But on what basis can he forgive you? Because God has to judge sin. He can't just say, oh, OK, you sinned, it's OK. I won't think. No. Sin has to be judged. So we have to emphasize that. The sin affects your relationship with God, and sin has to be judged. Then we bring in the next understanding of forgiveness. So they believe, they believe in the idea of forgiveness, but on what basis? They, if Allah wants to forgive me, He will forgive me. But this is where the sacrificial death of Jesus comes. Right? That Jesus died on the cross to make forgiveness possible. So it's not just like, uh, if Allah wants to forgive, He'll forgive. Well, God has made a way by which we can be forgiven, because our sins were judged in Christ. So we put, push, put that forward. And then an invitation to a relationship with God, the fatherhood of God. And that is where the big difference happens. And. Uh, that God can be our father, we can be sons and daughters of God, which is a concept that is not there in Islam. Right? That you can become a child of God. You can be a part of a son or a daughter of a part of his family. It's not. Right? So this is a new concept. And uh, the Christian life is not directed by fatwas or somebody that some Imam, some Mufti says, is directed by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Very different. Okay. So I remember reading one book. This was actually written um, by... Uh, um, the title of the book was uh, uh, Son of Hamas. So, so now we are reading a lot of news about Israel fighting with Hamas. And uh, so this book was written by the son of the founder of Hamas. So he describes how, so the title of the book is Son of Hamas. He describes how, you know, he's, he's growing up while all this fighting is going on. And uh, the hatred that they have towards the Christians, they're brought up like that, the Jews and the Christians. And so uh, somebody comes into their uh, camp and gives a New Testament. So initially he's very reluctant, but he takes it, he reads it. What is this? You know? And he finds that in the New Testament, uh, the life of Jesus is so different from Muhammad. So the life of Jesus just attracts him. The teachings and the life of Jesus, very different from what he is hearing in the, in the mosque and what he is reading about uh, Muhammad. Very different. So secretly he starts reading more. No. And eventually he gives his life to Jesus. But he's the son of the one of the leaders of Hamas. Very, very, you know, they're expecting him to take over. You know, of course, anytime anybody can be killed, killed and all that. But he's, he's expected to be the next, uh, come up and be the next leader. But now he's given his faith to, you know, put his faith in Jesus. So he shares his story, and now he, then he had to leave, and he's, he's he moved to the U.S. and uh, uh, I think he's alive, but in you know quiet hiding, like quiet in living in the U.S. And so he shares his story. 
but again this is this is a simple thing by reading the gospel by reading the life of jesus seeing the difference hey, this jesus what he taught he didn't teach violence but they're teaching violence he's showing love they, that's not what we are learning in, in islam so just seeing the difference his whole life got changed it's a very powerful book. Um, so, and of course, I'm sure that there are many, you know, the many people who have come to faith. All right, I see the chat and the chat. Gertrude has, uh, they don't ask questions about their faith, but they ask questions about the Trinity. Yeah, so if they ask about the Trinity, which, you know, some people have been trained to ask, then we give the best explanation. Uh, but don't get into too much debate on that. It's okay, see, we believe that God is in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they are co-equal. That's all I can say, you know. So how can God be in three persons? Okay, you don't worry about that. Let's talk about your relationship with God. Yeah, so we can explain what we know about the Trinity. Say a few words. They will struggle with it. We know they struggle with it. Even many Christians try to struggle to understand. But let's focus on our relationship with God. And, and, and we try to focus on that, right? And uh, point them to Jesus. But I think the, like just by reading all these testimonies of um, Muslims who've come to faith in Christ, the idea of, uh, I mean, the understanding of the fatherhood of God the understanding of the love of God, the understanding of the life of Jesus. These are very powerful things that bring about that change in their hearts. You know, just that. So we just talk about that and let the Holy Spirit bring about the conviction. We can't force anybody, but we can point them. See Jesus. See what he did. See God is giving you Forgiveness and salvation is a free gift. See, God wants to be wants you to be his son or daughter. So point them to it, leave the rest, let the Holy Spirit bring about conviction. Question? Pastor, just uh, three questions. Uh, one, when we say like Muslim who like submit, and yeah. we as Christians also surrender things. So can we infer that you know, as Christians we surrender out of love and they do it more out of fear? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So they do it out of fear. They do it sometimes even without understanding. But we know the love of God. We have tasted and seen. You know, this is God's love. So like what John says, you know, we love him because he first loved us. So that is our submission. Their submission is... In the epistle of Peter, when it says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil. So that's being more of, you know, uh, in obedience to God. Obedience to. So it's different from what these people believe. Correct. Perfect. And the second question, Pastor, just a practical thought. Like you know, when you see so much of uh, similarities of uh, Islam and Christian in the Old Testament and uh, thing, did these things really happen? So that's a good question, right? So, so when you're saying, uh, sorry, you're talking about the Old Testament events. Yeah. So one is we understand, we re recognize that the Old Testament was written well in advance, almost, um, we are talking about almost a thousand years before Muhammad. It was done, written, done, 1,000 years before Muhammad. So it was already there, the Old Testament, as given to the Jews. So when we see something different, then we say it's a derivative of the Old Testament. Clearly, it is not an inspired word, but it is man's derivative. 
So the things that are given in the Quran are a derivative. And it's been there for there are variations. But which came first? Old Testament was there. Thousand years before Muhammad. And this book was written after Muhammad, like, you know, based on some stories. And so definitely it's a derivative. And uh, of course, he's claiming Gabriel came and said, but then some both can't be right. The Old Testament was given 1000 years ago. That is correct. That is the original. Here you have some derivative, which is a variation and doesn't match. And it's not pointing to the same God. So here's another thing that sometimes people get confused. They try to, and it's a dangerous thing to do, they try to make Allah the same as Yahweh. And that's not true, right? Yahweh is the God of the Bible, starting from the, our understanding of the Old Testament, carried through to the New Testament. So Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So that means he's connecting back to the Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Not so with Islam or with Muhammad. So the God he points to, Allah, is not the same as Yahweh. So we should be very careful. Just because of this seeming similarity between Old Testament and what the Quran says, actually it's a derivative, but because of the seeming similarity, people then tend to confuse Allah and yeah, and it's not the same. It'd be very careful. Yeah. One last question, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, this is just on a personalized note. Like you know, I have actually uh, heard and seen uh, people who come from a different uh, faith background. For example, you would have heard uh, uh, Ram Kumar Ram Chandran, okay, when he preaches, or uh, you know, other uh, Muslim people. They have the Bible, the entire Bible. At the tip of their tongue, mm. okay, and they're like so inspired by the Holy Spirit and so anointed. Why is it at times, you know, I I, I do feel ashamed, but I, I give glory to God for their life and thing. But we are like grown up, born, bought up, raised from a Christian background, and is it that the anointing is like like missing, or is it that their dedication was so strong because they come from a total different faith background and uh, their life, their testimony, and their thing is in a different level mm. altogether, especially from people who've been raised completely from an opposite uh, faith background and they are like you know used so powerfully mm. so what is that distinguishes uh, for people i mean mm. like uh, like from the childhood we've been growing church this that but it's right. not on that comparative scale at all yeah i think so uh, see all of us have equal access uh, whether we are born in a traditional christian home or born in some other you know tradition all of us have, when we come into Christ, we all have equal access to everything God gives. Right? There's, there's no preference. God didn't say, oh, because you came from a non-Christian background, I'll give you more anointing. Nothing, nothing like that. It's all equal. It's just how much we press into it. You know, uh, how much are we pressing into it? And also, it depends on the call of God on our lives, right? So God has a calling, a, a different calling on each one's life. And the gifts and the calling of God on each one's life are different. And so you find the expression of the ministry different, right? Uh, so how much, it depends, so it, it depends on how much we press into. And what also is, what is also, what is God's call and gifting? And then that's what we see. Uh, and I think we can uh, look at it like how when Jesus gave, you know, he gave to one person one talent, another five, another ten. Just that, you know, one had one, one had five, one had ten. So we'd say, like, why does the person, that person has ten, looks very nice. No, we just gave differently. But what are we all going to be evaluated on? Whether we've been good and faithful. Yeah. So we're all going to be evaluated the same way. What have we done with what God has given? Okay. Um, so there's uh, Biju has a question on the chat. They ask why Bible has many versions, but their book doesn't have what to tell them. Yeah. So, you know, like what we uh, learned uh, a little earlier, one of the earlier chapters, uh, we, we, we learned about why are there many different versions of the Bible. It's, it's because 
uh, the translators have tried to address a different audience and the translators have tried to um, make the Bible understandable by different audiences. So it's the same original, I mean, we're all starting from the same manuscripts, original texts. Um, but when we do, so our goal, of course, so we say, okay, there are many versions of the Bible and many Bible is available in many languages simply because we want to make the word of God available and accessible to as many people. So that's why the Bible is translated into many languages. And even in some languages, there are many versions, meaning uh, the language that is used varies. So even in English, there are many versions because the translators are trying to address different audiences and using different techniques to go from the original Greek and Hebrew into English language while trying to maintain the uh, the meaning of the text. So we can explain that it's meant to address different groups of people, uh, make God's word available and accessible to different groups of people who understand English differently. Uh, that's why it's there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's move to the next lesson, which is a slight change in our topic. So we talked about how do we share Christ with uh, a Hindu and a Muslim, just giving us a little simple framework, not necessarily you know uh, some big explanation, but something for us to keep in mind when we share. Now we're going to talk about another topic in apologetics, which is about suffering. Right? So this is a difficult topic because and also a topic well where people have lots of questions like when we say god is a good god then people say if god is a good god why is there pain why is there suffering what is god doing why is he allowing all these things to happen in this world the devil looks bigger than god he's working more powerfully he's causing more trouble why is there so much of uh, evil and violence in this world? And why are there all these, uh, you know, earthquakes and volcanoes and uh, all these weather things that are destroying so many lives? You know, people have lots of questions, valid questions. But they're all uh, questions about suffering. Why is there suffering in this world? And then, again, when good people suffer, Hey, that was a good man. He was maybe, a, let's say, he was a minister of God, preacher. This is now suddenly suffering some, from some sickness, or maybe he had an accident, or something happened. And so, how we can't understand this? Why is bad? Why is bad things happening to good people? Where is God? Why did God allow it? And then, to make matters worse. Believers will say, God is doing this to me, to teach me a lesson. So, but I can easily go to Bible college and learn the lesson, <laughs> rather than go, go through some suffering and learn the lesson. Why is God doing this to me? You know? So they give these explanations. So it makes things very difficult to understand. So... What we want to do in this lesson, um, it, it is a difficult lesson, but let's uh, go through it. We want to try to, uh, to respond or try to understand this whole area of suffering uh, from a biblical perspective and uh, then you know, try to have a perspective, a biblical perspective on this whole area. So to begin with, First of all, we, we need to understand God's heart. Understand who God is. Okay? Don't get caught up in the whole issue of suffering itself. There is suffering. There is pain. There is evil. There is sin. There is violence. There's all these things. But let's start by looking at God. Understand the heart of God. And understand the heart of God in the light of his original intent and in the light of what he's going to do finally. Like, 
Look at the start, look at the finish. And then let's come to an understanding of who God is and what is going on. Okay. So in the very beginning, we see all that God created was good. That means in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, 2, 1 and 2, there was no suffering, there was no pain, there was no evil, there was no before the fall. Right? And uh, God had put the tree of life in the Garden of Eden so that life will continue on and on and on. Hmm? So you can eat of the tree of life. Go on. Right? And uh, they were not part of God's original design. They were not present at the Garden of Eden prior to the fall. So our conclusion must be that God's original intent was not suffering. That was not his original plan. Sin, sickness, disease, pain, all that we are seeing, that was not part of God's plan. Clear? So that was not part of his plan. Then today we must not say, okay, we suddenly he put it in his plan. Don't, don't change his plan. The original plan was, no, none of these things. Right? So, uh, we shouldn't accuse God of our pain and suffering. And, right? Then, uh, we know that prior to the fall of man, there was Lucifer, his fallen angels. They had been cast out of heaven. And... Uh, then he came in, in the form of a serpent. He got Adam and Eve, he deceived Adam and Eve, and got them to disobey God, and sin came into this world. And sin opened the door to all kinds of evil. Right? Page 84. But, remember this, we can also state this very confidently, that sin and its consequences are not part of God's original intent. It's not part of God's original He didn't create a world with sin. So sin itself is not part of God's original intent. And whatever came from sin, or because of sin, is also not part of God's original intent. It's not, that was not his plan. It was man's decision, yeah, we know. But there was not God's plan for sin. And the consequences of sin. So today we should not say, oh, God is making me sin. Or my sin is coming from God. No, don't say those things. God is not making you sin. God is not, that is not God, God's plan. And the consequences of sin. Right? So, if we um, understand God's heart in his original intent, that is not his desire for people to suffer right and uh, god is a god of love he does everything good so that should be very clear this is the nature of god he's a loving god he's a good god he does not want sin he does not want the things that have come in because of sin he doesn't want it right and uh, but Suffering is a present reality. We're not denying it. Yeah, it is there. There is suffering in this world uh, since the fall in the garden uh, from in, that started off in the Garden of Eden, and uh, it is there. We're not denying it. The question is, how? Why does it happen? How do we respond to it? So we look at the beginning. We look at the end. In the end, there'll be new heavens and the new earth. There's no death. There's no sin, there's no suffering. So we can clearly say God is not intending that for us, but right now there is suffering. How do we understand? How, what is God doing? How, what should we do when we see suffering? When we see, what all kinds of suffering? What should our response be? Okay? So we will continue this tomorrow. Uh, we will pick up from these uh, three realms in which we experience suffering. I'll stop here.
Any questions before we dismiss? Yes. Go ahead, Abhishek. Uh, Master, recently I'm um, talking to my Muslim friend and he asked me about the suffering. And I was sharing to him like uh, the sin, sinful nature, Satan, the fall of man and other stuff. And then he suddenly he asked me a question. Why the creator is not uh, just to finish the set and make everybody free and other stuff. So I just told like, uh, see, this is, these are the prophecies. This is going to happen in future. But he's like, why the creator himself has not uh, like uh, a control over his creation? Yeah. Yeah. So how do we respond to that? Now, part of the answer you've already given, which is, uh, on the end, but how do we respond to why he is not controlling? So our response is, God is creator, God is all-powerful, he's sovereign, but he created people with free moral agency. He has given man the freedom to choose. Angels, had a freedom of choice, right? So he didn't create robots, he didn't create machines. He created beings and he endowed them with the freedom to choose. And because God created us with the freedom to choose, he respects that within his boundaries. Okay? So within the boundary, he's respecting our freedom too. Choose. He said, okay, I gave you the freedom, enjoy it. You do what you want within the boundaries. Now, of course, within those boundaries, some people choose to do good, some people choose to do evil. And that's why we have evil, we have people doing all kinds of things, so on and so forth. So that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer, which you have mentioned, is we know the end. He has already revealed to us that one day, all this will be over. Uh, the the good, uh, those who believe in the Lord, whom He has changed, will be separated from the wicked, and uh, there will be the old heavens will pass away, and there will be new heavens and the new earth. And He has told us that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no sin, no sorrow, no pain, no, none of these weak, suff no suffering, nothing. So today there is suffering because of all these reasons, which we will look at next uh, next tomorrow. One of the reasons is because man has a freedom of choice, and uh, God has given man the choice, and he has sinned, and sin has a, has had its consequences. So, And God is respecting it. God is still sovereign. God is still God. But he is a loving man to make his choice, and live in the man in the live, living, live in the consequences of his choice. And God is still unfolding His plan and purpose towards that eternity uh, in new heavens and new earth. We'll look more about this tomorrow. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Muslim are also. Yeah. So Abraham had uh, Isaac and Ishmael. So the Arabs are considered descendants of Ishmael. The Jews are considered descendants of Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, on. So that is why the Bible also tells us that there is this ongoing conflict between the Arabs and the Jews or the Muslims and the Jews. Yeah. But both trace back to Abraham. Okay. Uh, we'll end the class today. We'll continue this tomorrow. We'll take more questions tomorrow as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the afternoon. We'll connect tomorrow morning. Thank you.